Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through this life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now been received reconciliation. So that's the end of scripture readings, and children can go to children's church. morning if you'll bow with me father in heaven we do thank you and praise you <clears throat> for your love for your grace for your mercy for your kindness your long suffering lord that you would send your son to die for us a, a stiff necked unholy people your enemies father that you would love even your enemies that at the right time you would send jesus christ to be a sacrifice a propitiation for our sins to forgive us and redeem us back to a right relationship with you. Not just back to you, but as your children, Lord. Fill us with your spirit today, Lord. Help us to hear your words and obey them. Lord, we thank you that, that Jesus did not orphan us and leave us alone, that he's interceding there in heaven for us, and that the Holy Spirit is here living and abiding with us so that we can have fellowship and that we can worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, help us not to take the salvation lightly, but to just praise you and, and give you thanks and, and glory every chance that we can, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you read your scripture reading, you noticed that we're in the book of Romans now. And there are volumes and volumes of commentary written for Romans. And I could spend a year or two, but we got like three weeks. So you should have read Romans chapters 1 through 5, and we're going to end at 5 verse 11 today, which is where Barry finished reading in Scripture. But let's introduce you a little bit first so that you can be familiar with it, and maybe you'll learn something here you didn't know. When and where was this letter written to the church in Rome? And remember, these are letters written to the churches for some particular re reason, and they're usually... Uh, delivered by somebody and read out loud and then shared with other churches because the other churches are going through the same things. There's continually from the outside persecution and from the inside heresies and false doctrines and it's there in all the churches and you'll see the evidence of it in here. And Paul longs to go to Rome because he is a Roman citizen and he wants to take the gospel message to the ends of the earth which is, is Rome and then on to Spain if he gets the opportunity. We're going back a little bit in Acts, though, to get some clues. We finished reading Acts, and at the end of Acts, you see that Paul is in house uh, arrest in prison, and he's there for two years and preaches the gospel unbound, unhindered. And who would have ever thought such a thing? But first, to get you an introduction, I'm going to take you back to Acts chapter 18. Paul is in Corinth on his third missionary journey. It's somewhere around the year A.D. 55, give or take. <clears throat> this is five years prior to the fact that Paul actually gets to Rome approximately. And in verse 1 of chapter 18, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, and who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. You constantly see in the book of Acts the Holy Spirit working, guiding the uh, apostles and uh, the lay people that are helping and everything, where to go to spread this gospel message so that literally what Jesus' word said become true, that the gospel will be preached in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And here they're driven out by persecution again from Rome. There is a church there already, and Priscilla and Aquila are driven out because Claudius is in reign then, and he says, get out of here. The church is being persecuted. If you drop down to verse 18, Paul stayed on at Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Chinchuria because of a vow he had taken. 
You don't see much about that city in the uh, Scripture, but it's going to be pivotal here again in a second. Sometime after this point, Paul writes this letter to Romans because he writes it before he goes there because he has a desire to visit them. We don't know exactly when he writes this letter, but these are some key clues that we have here. When we get into Acts chapter 23, Paul has taken the offering to Jerusalem. He's been arrested in verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And you know that that still took four years or so before Paul actually made it to Rome because he was left in prison uh, in uh, Israel, and then he uh, has his shipwreck, everything else, before he actually gets there. In Romans 16, verses 1 to 3, says, I commend to our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at Chincheria. Remember, I told you we'd see that again. I ask you to receive her in the, Lord, in the Lord in a way worthy of His people and to give her any help. That's at the end of Romans. Did you make it that far yet? See, you, you wouldn't have realized it unless you read the whole letter through. That gave us these clues that we went back to Acts 18 and found out that more than likely Phoebe is the one that is delivering this letter to the church in Rome and reading out loud. Because Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon in the church at Chincheria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in, any, in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me, and look here, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. So more than likely, that's who's delivering this letter to the church in Rome. When this happens, we don't know exactly. Because it doesn't say, I, Paul, write this letter in this year, and, and they're sending it by whoever. You've got to look for those clues. You've got to study God's Word. So what is the reason for this letter? Of course, Paul had a desire to go to Rome. Priscilla and Aquila had been driven out of Rome, so he knew that there was persecution of the church going on there. <clears throat> Then at some later point, as you read through the Scriptures, you'll find that, that um, there's clues that there are false teachers, that there are divisions between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, that there are people preaching Jesus plus again rather than just Jesus. And as you read Romans, you'll see the most theological letter, the longest letter Paul wrote, full of information about salvation, redemption, justification, sanctification, calling. But we're not going to get near that deep into it. We're just going to look at it simple. And it's so beautiful, so elegant, that all of God's plan was to create you and I knowing that we would rebel against Him and that it would cost Him the life of His one and only Son to redeem you. Not to just redeem you, not to just forgive you, to pour out the blood on the mercy seat, but also empower you to live as God's children. And see, the thing in the Christian community that's so sad is we don't train up disciples so that they obey. That We think we can live in this world the way we did before, but we're saved because we put our faith and trust in Jesus. The demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Are you working out your salvation with fear and trembling? James probably wrote the first letter to the churches, and he said, I don't believe your faith if it doesn't have actions. What does your life look like in this world? <clears throat> Let's look a little bit more at the end of Romans before we get into the beginning of Romans. In Romans 16, verses 17 to 20, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way. We fight a spiritual battle. When you're saved, this war intensifies because Satan, does, he might not have your soul, but he doesn't want you to be effective for the kingdom. That's why all this persecution is actually driving the gospel. So I struggle with this because we don't suffer in this world. It's not suffering to give up something, to say, oh, I can't go today to go fishing because I need to go over here and help this person with something they need. That's not suffering. These people suffered. And I, I'm torn with, we don't suffer in this world. You might lose your job. 
in this world being in the United States, there are plenty that suffer. But we have this freedom, so are we going to live like we're still in Rome? Or are we going to live a set-apart life different so that the Romans, the ones around that think they need the things of this world, will see Jesus through us? The same problems that continue to affect the church. Such people are not serving... <coughs> excuse me. Let me go back. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned, the way of Jesus, denying yourself, taking up your cross, and follow after, the, after, after Jesus, keeping away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but they are serving their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. So are you studying? Are you reading? Are you spending time in fellowship with one another in a Bible study or whatever it is so that God's Word is in you, implanted in you? And then are you hearing the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would reveal all truth to you. <clears throat> study God's Word to be an approved workman who rightly handles the Word of truth so that on that day you will not be ashamed. Verse 19, everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want, to, want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil, set apart from those things. Why? Verse 20, because the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. You don't want to be attached to him at all. And you're not attached to him at all. You were bought with the price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now I'm dropping down to verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the re revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all Gentiles, God is bringing everybody together, all tribes, every tongue, every nation, to the obedience that comes from faith. So I'm back to James again. If you've got faith, then are you being obedient? Because your obedience shows that you have faith. If you're not being obedient, I would question the faith that you say that you proclaim. Because there is no greater thing than Jesus Christ dying to save you that instead of God's wrath being poured out upon you, He pours out His blessings of mercy, grace, adoption. And I could go on and on and on. Not because of any of your righteousness. Because all of our righteousness, no matter how good you are, are as filthy rags. And God knew all this from the beginning of time that we can comprehend it and that He would send His Son to die for you while you were God's enemy. His enemy. I don't know about you, but my enemy, I don't think kindly about them. It's hard to love your enemy. It's hard to want good things to happen to your enemy. I want to do something else to my enemy. But while we were enemies, God loved us and gave us His one and only Son. Wow. What a salvation. And then Romans, the letter ends, To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Saved by faith in who Jesus is, what He has done for you to live a life of worth in this world. You, you got all that? You got all that story? That's the Christian faith. That's the church. Saved by God's grace through faith so that you will live differently because you know that you're a child of God and you can't do it on your own, so the Holy Spirit gives you the power to do it. And Jesus said, it's better for me to leave so that the Holy Spirit will come. So chapter 1 of Romans, <clears throat> you get the greetings about the good news and that it's, that it's changing lives. It's changing the, the way that people think and the way that people live and they're being persecuted. And that's okay because it doesn't matter because... They're looking for their, their heavenly home. They're looking for eternal. They're not looking for the things of this world. And they realize that Jesus is Lord and nothing will happen to them that's not in, in God's will. 
And even in these sufferings and things, the gospel message is being driven to other places because otherwise I'd probably become complacent and not do those things potentially. And they are so firmly founded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the hope that they have. It is a gift from God. In Romans 1, the ending of verse 5, it says, To call the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for His name's sake. Wait a minute. Didn't I just read that at the end of the letter? There it is at the beginning and there it is at the end. A call to obedience. The Jews should have already been obedient, but they realized from the law just how sinful they are because no one can keep all the law. But God, because of their disobedience, grafts in the wild vines into the olive tree so that there's one tree, so that there's one family called the church, God's family, the kingdom of heaven here on earth, so that we will be obedient children, so that the world will see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Romans 16, 26, to remind you, said, so that the, all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. Same words. The first is a, is a call and then the end of the letter is a fact that this is what is happening. <clears throat> Maybe you missed it. Faith brings about obedience. You see the works of it. Without that, you might want to examine the faith. So I say right now, examine. It's time. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Today is the day of your salvation. You know your lives. I don't know your lives. I know my life. And I know when I examine it, I find stuff in it that I wish wasn't there. I constantly go back to the words of Paul. He says, why do I do the things that I, that I choose not to do? Why do I continue to do them? Because I am a sinner saved by grace through faith. And Lord, please increase my faith so that I live a life of worth, bringing glory and honor to you. Because what else can I do for someone who loved me as much as you love me, always will love me, that nothing can separate me from God's love. And it's all because of the obedience of Jesus Christ in this world. I mentioned to you about James. I want to read you a little bit about James because all other kind of faith, faith is dead. And Paul presents this argument well that the whole world is going to be under God's wrath. Some religious heresies say, oh, God will never pour out His wrath on people. Hell is, a, is imagery. It's not literal. That's not what I believe. You can believe whatever you want. But here's the deal. The salvation is so great because the punishment was so much greater. You would have been forever separated from God because He's holy, righteous. He created you so that you would be in His presence and have communion and fellowship with Him. But because of our sins, we separated ourselves from that and we deserve God's wrath as His enemies. But the salvation is so much greater. I cannot imagine the wrath but Jesus took it so that I could be saved and not just saved, but so that I could live as a child of God. Are you seeing this? And that's where we'll end up in Romans 5, 11. And spoiler alert, you know what Romans chapter 8 is about. That spirit living. Because that's where he gets to. You've got to realize this or you won't live this life of worth that God intended You'll continue to struggle and fail and struggle and fail. Or you'll continue to struggle and let the Spirit of God, Romans 12, transform you. Wow. James wrote about faith this way. And like I said, this is probably the first letter written to the churches. In James 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. That God desires, that He wants for you and has given you the power and the ability to do it through His Spirit. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the Word planted in you, the new heart that you have, that His law is written upon your heart, which this can save you. Do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. In James chapter 2, verse 14, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? 
Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. Think about this as you're reading through Romans. Like Paul, James talks about suffering, what suffering produces. He also talks about Abraham's faith, which he read that in the first chapters of Romans. And then in James chapter 4, verse 4, here's the thing. You adulterous people. He didn't say you wicked people. He said you adulterous people. You have committed adultery against the God who saved you and the Holy Spirit who made you His own. Because you're continuing to live the ways of the world rather than to live the ways of God. You're being unfaithful, you adulterous person. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity, that you're an enemy of God, that you're against Him. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? I expect Sherry to be faithful to me. She expects me to be faithful to her. That's what she expects. And anything less is wrong, wrong, wrong. And it caused me so angry. Because we've not been faithful. We've been adulterous. Are you faithful to the faith that you say that you profess? James goes on in chapter 4, verse 9, to say, Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter that you have while you're doing these adulterous deeds to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Verse 13, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this or that city, spend a year carrying on business and make money. I read this last week, if you don't remember it. Why you, don't, why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, the opposite. You ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this or that. Every day I get up and make my plans. And every day, pretty much, along the way somewhere, I say, Father, forgive me. What did you have planned today? I just think that I'm supposed to go to work. I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to glorify God, and the rest is stuff that's out there beside that. He will feed me. He will clothe me. Why would I worry about those things? And if He loved me enough to send His Son to die for me, why in the world am I not in the business of reconciliation? I am Christ's ambassador as though God were making His appeal through me. That's what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. So I said it before, I'll say it again. Maybe you should stop, maybe we should stop and examine our life and our faith for a moment. What does it look like compared to James's words? Before we get into Paul's. And like I said, don't try to figure out all these things and know just exactly how justification and sanctification works. All you need is the faith of a little child to come to your Father in heaven and let Him wrap His arms around you. What is the good, what is the good news that saves people and changes them into little Christ? Is that the good news that you profess? Is that the good news that you live? Back to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. You should know that one. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power, the dynamite, the explosiveness of God that brings salvation. Isn't that what you want for everyone, even your enemies? It should be, because if you were enemy of God, and He loved you enough that He gave Christ for you, that should be what you want. I know you want it for your children, for your loved ones, your friends, and you should even want it for your enemies. And it's evident in the lives of the, of the first church. Is it evident in your life? That no matter what anyone can do to you, what you want for them is to know Jesus Christ, to know God's love for them, to be saved and become a child of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. 
to first the Jew, then the Gentile. But look at the divisions that are still in the early church, and they'll be here until Jesus comes back. Verse 17, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Nothing but faith. Not your works, not your ceremonies, not anything else, not going to church, by faith. So if you have this faith, if you really profess it, if you think it's going to turn cold, because this morning was cold, then you're going to get your jacket out of the closet. You'd be a fool not to. You're going to get firewood because you're going to build and burn a fire. If you know the wrath of God is coming, what are you doing about it to tell the world and live a life so that they'll see it in you? Because the wrath of God is coming against all ungodliness. And just because the world doesn't believe it or see it doesn't mean that it's not a fact. But salvation is coming to anyone who believes the message of Jesus Christ. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. How are you doing? Is that how you're living? It's not your power. Like I said, it's a submissive to the Holy Spirit to transform you, to change you. Think about that as you read the next chapters of Romans. As you read on in verse 18 and 19, here's the alternative. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. There's no way the beauty of this world, the order, the laws that we have that govern this creation, the heavens that declare the glory of God, the, the complexity of human life, the heritage of a child being born, God is real. God loves you. He loves you enough that He sent His one and only Son to redeem you back to Him. Is this how you live? Because the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. See, we don't think we're that wicked. We want to think we're okay, we're good. We are filthy, corrupt, and that's how God saved us in that state and clothe us with the robes and righteousness of Jesus. So are we living like it? They're the ones who suppress the truth by their wickedness, by not giving God praise, by not living for King Jesus, by continuing to live the ways of the empire of this world, whether it be Rome or the good old United States. Which one will you choose? The true gospel or some other version of it? Will you choose the gospel of Jesus Christ? in its entirety. Are you saved? Or are you still facing God's wrath? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Going on reading in Romans chapter 1, verse 30, 32 through 2, 6. I'm going to read it continuously because remember it's a continuous letter. When you break into chapters, sometimes you miss some of the points in what the, the author is writing. At the end of chapter 1, Although they knew God's righteousness, righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. You, therefore, reading straight on into chapter 2, have no excuse. You, have, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you condemn yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Well, I'm not an adulterer. Jesus said, if you've thought it in your heart, you're guilty of it. I'm not a murderer. If I've had anger in my heart towards my brother, Jesus said, you are guilty of it. Wow. I'm just as bad as anyone else. And my salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, just like anyone else, so that I can't boast you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment, who, you, because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, 
Do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kind forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance, to change the way you think, to change your heart, to change the way you live? Do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness on you while you are still His enemies? Verse 5, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentative heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the, day of God, for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they think. No, it doesn't say that. According to what they've done in this body. If you have this salvation, what are you doing with it? Thank you, Jesus. This is a great salvation that He has saved me from a great wrath that I cannot even contemplate. What a great salvation. How can I keep quiet? How can I not be changed? Romans chapter 2, verse 10, But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who thinks, no, does good. Some of the Jews thought because of the law, because of circumcision, they were okay. They didn't examine their heart. I said it's time to examine and see that they were angry, jealous. They did not, they had idols in their, their ceremonies. Everything else, they were guilty of all of it. Paul, Paul said, you know, that he didn't even understand. He thought he was okay until he hit that point of thou shalt not covet. Because his life was built upon that. And then you see that he gave it all up. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. He's setting up his argument. Verse 10, as it is written, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. Good for nothing without any worth whatsoever. There is no one who does good, not even one. So how can there be hope of me saving myself? Thank you, Jesus. Reading on down in verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. He's got it again. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed before unpunished. He did... He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. It's a lot. Here we go. God is good. Totally. Totally righteous. Totally just. And He loves you. And by faith you can receive Jesus' righteousness because what He's done. Will you do it? You don't need to understand all the other. Will you receive it by faith and will you let that faith increase and transform you to where you're like Christ and where the things of this world don't matter, what matters is living for Jesus because there come a day when you will spend eternity in heaven rather than facing God's wrath. Thank you, Jesus. In Romans chapter 4, the, fa the father of faith... Uh, of the Father of the Jewish faith, Father Abraham, is looked at in his righteousness. Paul presents the argument that it came before any of the other things. It was by faith again that Abraham was counted as righteous. And then he received God's promise. In verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 20, the chapter ends, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. We know that he wasn't perfect. We know that he stumbled. But his faith increased. He believed God's promise. And because of his faith, it was counted to him as righteous. You see it in letter James. You see it in Hebrews. Verse 21, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Verse 22, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. 
Now, to give you a little bit more about that term, but you don't need to understand, that's more like a legal thing. You are not guilty anymore. You have been pardoned. All the crimes against you are dismissed. They will never come up again. The court has been settled. It is done by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, what are you going to do with it? <clears throat> Verse 23, the word it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us. To whom God will credit righteousness. Again, not because of anything we've done. Pardon, not guilty. Mine. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Now we're getting in the resurrection. And Jesus died for our sins, and yeah, He needed to be raised back to life so that people would believe, you know, this. The resurrection is our hope and everything. But He was also raised back to life to justify you that much more. Justification is a one-time thing. That's why I said don't get way off on this. But then it continues to talk about the justification you have because Jesus is alive. And the fact that He went to heaven and He's mediating there for you and that He will come again and bring you this eternal life and He will set all things right. And He, sent his, he asked the Father to send His Spirit to change you. All of this is still being done. It has been done. It, it, it's mind-boggling. But all I need to know about is it's done. Because of my faith in Jesus, I have been cleared of all charges so what am I going to do with this? <clears throat> you commit a crime. You know you're guilty. Maybe you get caught, maybe you don't. Everybody's going to get caught. See, here's the thing. You know also, everyone knows that the crime requires a punishment, right? Everyone knows that. Even a child, when they get to any kind of age. The penalty for God, for sinning against God, though, is His eternal wrath, eternal death. I could get into that and talk about those things. But there's also everything that you've wanted in your life that, that is good, that you can think of as good, is gone. See, with an earthly crime, you serve out your sentence, and the worst thing is death, and then it's over. <laughs> that ain't incredible case with an eternal crime because death continues oh, the, the salvation that Jesus brings from the wrath of God he paid the price to set you free yeah he was beaten he was spit upon he was mocked he was crucified he was also separated from God he took your sin and shame upon his soldier, shoulders think of that pain that He went through for you so that you could be redeemed, so that you could live a justified life. What would you say if that criminal served his crime again, even if it was a death penalty, and someone else came in and, and substituted their life for his, and then that person went back to living the way they did before? We're called to live a holy, set-apart life and proclaim when we have the opportunity why we live the way that we do. Jesus didn't stay dead. He gave us life so that we could have life. So let's look at Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, okay, therefore means Paul's tying this whole argument together, everything that he's explained so far. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Here's where I was, here's where I am now. Therefore, since you've been justified, there we've got the term again, and notice been justified, past tense, okay? Declared righteous through faith, it's a done deal, nothing can change it, nothing can take it away if, in fact, it's genuine. Therefore, since we have been justified, we have peace with God. Okay, you can, you can be pardoned again and not have peace with the ones that you committed the crime against. But you've got peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 2, Through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace which we now stand. The life we have here and the life we will have forevermore. 
All the blessings, even in the midst of suffering, I didn't get into that, but it's there and it's there in James, the suffering that we have that produces patience and everything, which we'll get into in a little bit where he says it here. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, now and forevermore. Stand, not weak need, not sit, but we stand firm in it. And we boast, we don't keep our mouth shut, but we boast, we proclaim not only what Jesus Christ done, but we say, hey, this is what Jesus has done for me. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Wait a minute, Romans 3.23 said, all fall, hell have fallen short of the glory of God. And now we are here boasting in the glory of God because we are a part of that. We are His children. Verse 3, not only so, but more. Here's where it helps you look at some other translations, look at the original text. He's presenting this again. He says, not only what I've just said, <laughs> but here's so much more. We also glory in our sufferings. Wow. There's where I struggle. Like I said, what am I suffering, Lord? Uh, so what if I gave this up today? What, what if this cost me this? I'm not suffering like the church did then. Oh, okay, well, uh, suffering, if that's what it is, that's what it is, and I'm, gonna, I'm sure I'm going to pout and say, why me, Lord? But since I'm not suffering, give me a heart to use everything you've given richly because you filled the barns. Help me not to be a fool. Before my life is required, help me to live richly to others so that they can see you through me. We also glory in suffering. Because we know that besides glory, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope, which we've already had. We see that from the Scripture, but it increases. And hope does not put us to shame, even though the world thinks it does because you're suffering. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. If God's love is poured out, that means the love that would give His only Son is in your heart, and it should be pouring out of you. <clears throat> because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We didn't do anything. God gave Him to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Not a righteous person. <laughs> Very rarely, verse 7, will anyone die for a righteous person, which already been presented, doesn't even exist. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Setting up this argument. But, verse 8, well, this is one of the big but verses. Not this kind of big but, but the opposite of, okay? The opposite of everything else, but God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How many of you know that verse? Everybody? Mostly? Do you know the next verses? This is the one's Barry read. Because he set up this argument again and told you what happened, but what are you going to do with it? You're doomed for wrath, everything else. You think you're righteous, everything else, but you're not. But God demonstrated in His love while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Dot, dot, dot. Okay? Since we now have been justified by His blood, we should do something, right? Well, here's the original script again. The original script says, where the first said, but more in verse 3, or you had not only, says much more than. And you'll find that several times in this passage. What does that mean? Much more than. All this that I'm telling you about, and if you're getting any comprehension of that, and you're like, wow, much more than that. Since we have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? That is good news. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 10, For if... While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. How much more have been, having been, rec been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Some deep theology here. Let me explain it this way again. 
Jesus, in his weakest point, as far as we see it from a human standpoint, a lamb taken to slaughter, spit upon, mocked, never saying anything against this unjust crime, whipped, dying, dead, saved you. And the ultimate of weakness and what looked like the worst thing ever. How much more do you think his life now in heaven and coming back to reign, how much more is that power in your life? If in the weakest point, death saved you, how much more will his life sustain you for all eternity? And that is now. All these have already taken place. They're either past tense because you've been justified or they're going on now and they will continue on forever. This is the salvation that you have. Verse 11, not only this, but much more. <laughs> we also boast because we can't help but it. We boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now been received reconciliation. That's where I'm ending. I know there was some more that you read there. Are you getting what He's presented to you? Do you see how great this salvation was and what the wrath that Jesus took from you if and when you believed? So what are you going to do with this salvation? I want to read those, that Scripture for you in the King James Version. Harder to read, but it's the most literal translation to the original words, but in our new versions, and I'll say this just as a teaching, so you get NIV version, ESV version, King James version, those are Bibles. New Living Translation, which I'll tell you that I like, is a translation. It's not a accredited Bible. Okay, King James version. For, um, let me start in verse 9. Much more than, remember I told you that's there? And that helps me rather than the NIV having sense. I, I understand how these words play, but this much more than is there. Much more than being now justified. You didn't do it. God did it for you. Now justified. By His blood we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. Whose blood? Jesus. Who saved us from the wrath? Jesus. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled, done deal, to God by the death of who? Jesus. <clears throat> Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved, be saved now and forevermore by His life, the power that He gives us to live, the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us Revealing Jesus to us. How much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we joy. We boast. Okay, <laughs> here's the thing. Is that in your life? Because that part seems to be missing from a lot of Christians. And I know you know them. <laughs> They're Christians. And <laughs> I ain't going to help this person. You can't. We joy and boast because we can't do anything else. Is that part there? And it's, that's from God. The joy that Christ had for going to the cross, He wants you to have. Paul had it. We also joy in God through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom, Jesus again, we have now received, nothing we've done, the atonement. Paid for. Price paid for. So that we can what? So that we can live for Jesus? Is that what you put to that? That's what I put to it. And it takes everything I've got to do this every day. And it takes me denying watching television so I can read my Bible. And it takes setting aside a time to pray. And it takes a time to come to church and to other Bible studies and everything. Because that's what matters. And it takes time to go out of my comfort zone and go help this person. Or do this deed. Or whatever it is. But there's nothing else that means any more. 
Because it's not about building up kingdoms. It's not about what you eat or what you wear. Jesus is clear about all that. He'll give you all those things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And if you just trust in Jesus, you'd have all that and so much more for eternity. You build up eternal rewards. Is your life a testimony? And are you boasting to the world about the salvation that you have through Jesus Christ? Thank you, Jesus. Father in heaven, what a great salvation that we have that we take for granted so much. Thank you for Paul's words. Thank you for his faithfulness. Thank you that he considered the rest of the things of this world rubbish and garbage. That he had faith to follow you even through the stormy seas. It didn't, it, that it increased his faith. It didn't decrease his faith. And that we have those, so many examples of those through the early church. Lord, help us to be a people, a church that doesn't have bigotry, that doesn't have enmity, Lord, that has peace, that has joy, and tells the world about them because we can't keep quiet of such a great salvation. Oh, God, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Spirit, for being with us to guide us, to seal us, to transform us. Help us to not fight against you, but to walk step by step with you, O Spirit. We thank you in the name of Jesus. We praise you, O Heavenly Father. May we bring glory and honor to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.